This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Hello, welcome to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. Welcome to the show. With this podcast, I share a variety of stories from the most well-known dynasty of them all, the Tudors. From simple stories about the people of the time to the drama that was the reign of Henry VIII. And of course, politics. This show is presented to you commercial-free thanks to my wonderful patrons. If you'd like to help, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash tutorsdynasty and click become a patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can help keep this show commercial-free. I have two new patrons this month. Adrian and Gabby. Thank you so much, you two, for becoming patrons. It really means the world to me. We have a special guest on the show today, Rose Rylett. Rose is a self-professed Anglophile, as well as a wife and mother of two. Rose runs a blog called My British Obsession, where she shares some of her Tudor recipes, as well as other wonderful creations. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you so much for being on. Now, not only do you run a blog, but you were chosen as a contestant on the Great American Baking Challenge, right? Yes, yes. I am a huge fan of the British version, so I'd love to hear (laughs) how that happened and what it was like. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. Well, um, I went through an extensive process of auditions and interviews, um, and the American one is actually also shot in England. Same tent, same production company. So I left for England and, um, you know, I created all these recipes um, because, you know, you really don't have much time to practice there. Like the British one, they get to go home and, you know, uh, practice that we can't do that. So but anyways, I I got there. um, Actually, on my way um, on the plane, I fainted. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Um, And then I got there and then I fainted again. A uh, long story, but legally they just, you know, I wasn't allowed to carry on. I was in the emergency room and all that. So I actually had to drop out the day before filming. Oh my gosh, how sad. Yeah, yeah. So was it just nerves? <laughs> I know it's just, um, it's a really long story, but okay. I had a really bad reaction to a medication um, that they put in the uh, in my IV in the emergency room back in 2016. And um, I've sort of been like this ever since. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. oh it's, man. It's, it's a process and trying to figure everything out. But <laughs> yeah, but oh. it was beautiful. I can only imagine. I'm still still working on a, on a trip there. So I, I can't. Anytime oh. somebody says they go there, I'm so envious. It's wonderful. Hampton Court was just everything I dreamed it would be. I I left my phone back at the flat, so I I couldn't take photos, but it was really wonderful. It's ingrained in your mind. Yes, it is. (laughs) (laughs) So I do have a question for you. Now, I love Paul Hollywood and his piercing blue eyes. What was he like? Did you get to meet him? Well, you know, I didn't get a chance to meet him because, um, you know, you sort of deal with the producers and crew members before filming. And I never got a chance to go into the tent because I was in the emergency room. So, oh, oh no, <laughs> I know, such a shame. <laughs> but what a cool experience to be able to go through and to, you know, to get chosen to even be able to go. So yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> So we know that you have a passion for baking and Tudor history. So with that in mind, let's just talk a little bit about Henry VIII. Now, we know Henry is infamous for being married six times, executing Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard and separating from the Catholic Church. We also know that the once young and athletic king did not stay that way for very long. Can (laughs) you tell me a little bit about his eating habits and maybe what he ate on a daily basis? Yes. Um, Well, I will tell you as much as I possibly can. So Henry VIII was, as you said, a very athletic king. He had a very powerful build. He was tall, 6'2", handsome, you know, overall just aesthetically perfect. But, you know, he did love his food, however. And, you know, when he was younger and more active, I think, you know, it would have been a lot easier for him to burn off those calories. (laughs) But as he got older um, and he had the ulcerated leg and everything, he just started to become morbidly obese. And the foods that contributed to that, on a daily basis, he would eat about 13 dishes a day that mainly consisted of, you know, meats and sugar and wine and ale. 
I mean, there is a whole list of things that, I mean, I'm, I think you'd be shocked to hear the things. I mean, pork, game, lamb, some are very classic things that we eat today. But he also had um, oxen, beaver, puffins, <laughs> wow. um, deer, pigeons, venison, uh, rabbits, songbirds, peacocks, swan, like dolphins and whales, if he could get his hands on them. Wow. Yeah. So, um his, you know, wine would be spiked with sugar and even his meats, like his meat pies had sugar in them because, you know, you have to understand that sugar was a luxury and it was incredibly expensive and valuable. And being the king, you know, he has to show his wealth and worth. So sugar played a huge, enormous part in his court and daily lifestyle. So are you telling me he didn't eat salad? Uh, not much um, <laughs> because vegetables and, you know, raw vegetables, especially in the Tudor times, it was thought to be indigestible and unhealthy. So, you know, um, and he wouldn't eat vegetables that were grown underground because it's below ground and below his station, really. Um, but now we know that root vegetables are very, very nutritious and very good for you. So <laughs> he had salads that had, you know, Maybe like lettuce with several oranges, um, but no, he didn't have much vegetables at all. Such a different time it was, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Now, when we chatted the other day, um, you had mentioned something about trenchers. Can you explain <laughs> what that was? Because I imagine somebody digging but that's not the case, is it? <laughs> no. So um, trenchers were plates uh, that were eaten off of. And the wealthy lords and obviously the royals would have gold or silver trenchers. But the general public and servants would eat off of trenchers that were made out of four-day-old stale bread, which I think is ingenious. But I suppose to them it was necessary, um, the only option really. And afterwards, they would eat the trencher or, you know, use for alms for the poor. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> now, what was it like for servers during the Tudor era? Well, for starters, women were not allowed to serve. Uh, it was the men who were saddled with that duty. And there was a master carver who would know his way around each and every animal. So it was really an art in itself, carving. Um, and each dish would be presented to the king, and then he would choose you know, his liking, which dishes he would want to have. Wow. Do you have any idea like how many servers that they had at a, at a meal for the king? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm going to throw Doesn't. one there for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I imagine that they also have a certain type of dress code. They all have to probably look the same. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And now the tutors did not have forks to eat, correct? They ate with their hands for the most part? Correct. Uh, so in the 16th century post-Reformation, Italy was sort of their enemy. And the fork being an Italian invention, it was looked down upon and were not used. And also, you know, just because they ate with their hands, it doesn't mean they were Slavs. A lot of people think the Tudors ate like Slavs, but um, on the contrary, they had an unbelievably high standard when it came to courtesy and good manners. And, um, you know, etiquette wasn't a term they used or was invented at the time, but good manners and courtesy was the equivalent. And it was absolutely vital, especially in court. It's I sometimes I really wish like I could go back in time and just right? be a fly on the wall yeah. and just experience <laughs> it all firsthand. Yes, I know. <laughs> Although I don't think I'd want to be a woman during Tudor times. No. I really feel like I would have lost my head rather quickly. <laughs> They'd be like, why are you speaking up so much? You shouldn't have an opinion on things. I'd be like, yeah, I do have an opinion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we talked a little bit um, about what, what Henry ate. Um, we talked about trenchers. We talked about forks. Now I kind of want to look at a little bit more of the food, because some of the food during this time wasn't available to everyone in England. Yeah. Um, like the type of bread that they ate was separated mm -hmm. by social class. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, bread was like, you know, you mentioned earlier was an important staple in Tudor England. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was being eaten at most meals. Now, if you were wealthy, you would eat like a white bread made of whole flour. Yes. But if you were poor, your bread would be made from like rye or even ground acorns. Yes. Now, now, it didn't stop there. Can you tell me a little bit more about what English subjects ate? 
Yes, absolutely. So um, the white bread that you were speaking of is a white wheaten bread raised with fresh brewing yeast called manchet. Um, and King Henry in particular, he would take the manchet and slice the top off and eat only the, the top half, which is the upper crust, also meaning high class. Mm. And yeah, it had a crunchy crust and chewier texture than what we would eat nowadays. And it, it was more filling as well. Um, but like you said, the servants and, and the poor ate breads made of uh, rye and barley and oats. And uh, the very poor would even have bread that was uh, a mixture of barley and pea flour. And and these are breads that are now known to be healthier. And it's it's actually very I ironic that he had the diet you know if he had the diet of his servants he may have lived longer and had a healthier life um because the poor ate mostly pottage which is a uh, thick vegetable stew and um, they they mostly ate vegetables so they were almost vegans or, or vegetarians <laughs> <laughs> now they would add some like very very small bits of salted bacon um of oh. course all the meats were salted to preserve um it but if they had any bits they would toss it in there but again very rarely did they have access to meats interesting let's talk a little bit more about preservation now that you brought that up mm -hmm. because that's an interesting subject nowadays we have you know some people have cellars in their house where they can goods and stuff because they have a large garden and they want you know want it to be able to last you know through the year or whatnot right. how did they do it back then so i mean now we do it just because we have a taste for it <laughs> mm -hmm. and we're used to it but back then it was again you know necessary they had to do that to preserve throughout the winter you know so Again, fruits and vegetables, they were not um, eaten fresh because it was known to be indigestible and unhealthy. So they had to preserve it with salt or sugars. And, um, you know, a lot of the poor people, well, most poor people, they they never even saw sugar. They, they don't even know. They never had access to it because it was just so expensive. But, you know, obviously in court, they made jams and um, they ate, uh, they, they preserved fruits kind of like we do now with, um, and, and made jams and jellies and, and things like that. <laughs> it's so amazing how many things have stayed the same yet. There yeah. are many changes. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. I often get requests um, from people who follow my blog or my my Facebook page. They always want to know more about the average person living during this era. And we've covered it a little bit now. We know that if you were not a noble or say a courtier, that you probably ate very differently from your counterparts, mm -hmm. which we covered a little. Mm -hmm. How did table manners or etiquette differ between the two classes? In my knowledge, even if you weren't part of the court or noble uh, lord or lady, courtesy and good manners were part of the Tudor life. So it was important to be well behaved and well taught in such matters. So to my understanding, it may have not been to the extent of the people in court, but it was still definitely better than table manners we have now. <laughs> um, they were very clean. Cleanliness was so crucial. And, you know, to a point where if there was a communal bowl, they they could only use their left hand to touch the food um, because the right hand was used for cutlery. And some would even bring their own knife and spoon. This was all to prevent anyone touching food eaten by someone else. That fascinates me. They were worried yeah. about it when they were eating, yeah. but in other aspects of the society, they didn't seem as concerned about those things. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, the thing, you know, when we talk about f British food, um, I just have to mention this, that a lot of people make fun of British food quite often and they call it bland. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what it's like now, because I think you know, because during the war they had to ration and a lot of foods weren't available or incredibly expensive. So things may have been planned. But back then in the Tudor times, it was anything but planned. And um, there were so many exotic spices and fresh herbs that were used to flavor the dishes. Um, obviously not available to the general public, but to the wealthy and especially King Henry, I believe food was out of this world amazing. Oh, I want to try it. I know. <laughs> we should make it. I think we should make it. <laughs> that sounds well. I'll let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, 
Another Tudor monarch that we hear the most about, and I would say arguably probably the most popular of all the Tudor monarchs, is Queen Elizabeth I. Mm, Yes. Now, Elizabeth is widely known to have had horrible teeth. Mm -hmm. And from what I know, she really enjoyed marzipan, which may have been one of the causes of her rotting teeth. Now, can you tell me a little bit about it and and what goes into making it? Yeah. So um, Elizabeth I had black teeth um, because she was so fond of sugar. And ultimately, she was known to brush her teeth with sugar and honey. And uh, I mean, can you imagine that? That's <laughs> right. It seems odd to us now. Yeah. So, but she was also known to have lots of toothaches and horrible teeth as a young child because she had access to sugar and, you know, all the sweets she could get her hands on. Um, that being said, marzipan, which was also known as March Pain, March Pain is a cake made with marzipan. And, you know, m- with most things, um, like like most things back then, it was incredibly tedious to, it was just a very labor intensive thing to make marzipan. They had to take the block of sugar, basically pulverize it to granulated sugar, and then uh, pound it even more down to a powder. They had to use a a pestle and mortar uh, because they didn't have machines. Nowadays, we can just throw it in, you know, a machine and just blend it in five seconds. But, um, you know, they couldn't do that back then. And they would also have to blanch the almonds, dry them, grind that up to a fine powder, add rose water, egg whites, and that's pretty much marzipan, which is a almond paste that hardens as it dries. So is it just flat? Um, Like a sheet? Well, you could, so you could drape it over cake um, and, or you could just serve it as is, create little, um, you know, fruits, little decorations with it. Um, And they were, I mean, these were decorated elaborately, uh, like most things in the Tudor times. And, you know, now we just take it for granted. We could go to the store and purchase the bag of powdered sugar for 99 cents. But, you know, it's just amazing just to think about the labor that went into making these. Well, that's another thing. When you think about the Tudor kitchens, I think it's, um, I've watched some of those, you know, videos where, you know, they show what it would have looked like if you were working in the Tudor kitchen at that time with the giant fireplaces for cooking the meat and the tables everywhere. And, you know, you're talking about dozens and dozens of people in Mm -hmm. these kitchens and how amazing, I mean, do you have any idea how many hours a day they spent in the kitchen? Oh my good. All day. I mean, they woke up around four five in the morning. They actually started work five in the morning. So they must have gotten up earlier than that um, because they had to light the fire first thing um, because that took a while. And then, you know, the bakers, they had to start baking the bread. And um, bread was thought to be, fresh bread was thought to be, you know, again, they thought it gave you indigestion. (laughs) (laughs) So they had to wait a day. So they were actually baking the bread for the next morning. But, you know, there were there was there were tasks for everybody and everybody had a role in the kitchen. And it was just backbreaking work morning to night. And the kitchens would be painted with white. It it was what they had white kitchens because they had to work off of the the sunlight and, you know, it would reflect off of the white walls. So they were they were there till till night. And then, I mean, I can't imagine they probably only got a few hours of sleep. I really hope they were paid well for this. They- <laughs> <laughs> I know I watched something once where they were talking about the, the man that was responsible for turning the meats um, yes. by the fire and how that person would get more ale. Um, obviously because they'd be standing by the hot heat right, all right. day as much as they wanted. Yeah. <laughs> now it's not like the beer that we know of today. It was more of a watered down version, I believe. Yes. Um, you know, people joke that back then they, they were always drunk, but, um, <laughs> they, they may have been, but they, they made it without hops. And, um, so it was less bitter and it was more watered down because, you know, water wasn't, um, something that they were able to safely drink. So they had to drink ale and beer and wine, um, you know, watered down ale, even children had to, because it just wasn't safe back then. 
what I, I keep saying this, but it was such a different time. It was. I mean, if you didn't cook, you didn't eat. You know, like you did, if you didn't grow the vegetables, you yeah. didn't eat. So you just had to do so much just to survive. Wow. So hey, there was no McDonald's. You know, yeah. I don't I don't want to cook today. So I'm going to go run through the drive through healthier that way. But <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely healthier. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the show that you have a blog. Yeah. And that you've done some tutor recipes. Um, can you tell me what tutor recipes you've done? So I actually, um, so because of the show, um, the, the Great American Baking Show, we had to create 12 recipes. And uh, one was, you know, they had, we had pastry week and then we had bread week and things like that. And um, it was, I made a peacock pie. I didn't know when I created the recipe that they actually had something called a peacock pie. Um, and it wasn't a Tudor recipe, but it's just funny that that's what I called it. And um, I basically called it that because I just put so many different uh, colors in it, um, like dried fruits and nuts and things like that in there. Um, and also the pastry part had a little bit of heat. Um, oh. I put some chili powder. Yeah. So it was cayenne pepper and chocolate and bourbon. So the decorations for that, um, I have a peacock blowing fire out of its mouth. And back then when they, in the Tudor times, actual peacock pies uh, were served with the uh, beak lit on fire. So it was just a, such wow. a coincidence um, that I came up with that recipe. And I just, I, I joke now that I must have been a Tudor back then. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you're talking about this peacock pie, and it reminded me of an episode on the Tudors where um, somebody cut into a pie and birds came flying out. Yeah. <laughs> did they really do stuff? They like did. They did do things like that. Um, and, you know, they were they were really big on creating foods that didn't look like or that looked like something else. So... For instance, you know, if you see highly decorated cakes nowadays, like fondant cakes, we'll make little animals or we'll make little, um, you know, like apples with fondants or, or different things like that. But they actually, you know, started that. Uh, it <laughs> was like yeah. it was a stage for them really to show, you know, how yeah. important they were and how much money they had. That's kind of the way that I see it. Like, look yeah, how wonderful absolutely. we are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sugar, again, very expensive. So I don't know if they really had much room to make mistakes. <laughs> Those poor cooks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so other than peacock pie, what other types of recipes have you done that might be considered Tudor? Well, I created a bread sculpture. They asked us to make a bread sculpture. And um, I, you know, didn't want, I, I didn't, I love history so much. So I really wanted to incorporate um, history into my bread sculpture and so I created a Tudor rose it doesn't I guess really look like a Tudor rose <laughs> <laughs> but um, it you know it has the red petals on the outside and the white petals on the inside and um, you know it's it was really for the six wives of Henry the eighth and I just wanted to tell a little story about just just, just a small you know, thing about each and every one of them. So yeah, that, that Tudor Rose bread sculpture is dedicated to the six wives of Henry the eighth. The ones that we can't stop talking about. No. Yeah, I know. There's, they're just infamous, <laughs> they, you know, and it's one of those things, you know, Henry the eighth is really what got me interested in the Tudors just because his story is so crazy. And then you start to learn about how this man was married six times and he executed. It's just one of those stories that you just gravitate to towards because it's almost unimaginable that it, this happened yeah. to people. It's fascinating. Tragic. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we can't get enough of it. And we're, you know, 400 over 400 years later and we're still talking, talking about, them. about them. Yeah. It's, I feel like historians are um, almost like glorified um, gossipers. Like we love to, I mean, I'm not yeah. a historian, but I, I just, I love historians and, and we like to talk about them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, 
you have recipes or not recipes, but you have videos up on your your I blog. Do. Yes, I do. Rose, I'm so happy that you were willing to come on the show today. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, this is such an honor. And I want to make sure that everybody knows to check out your blog. It's mybritishobsession.wordpress.com. <laughs> there we go. Mybritishobsession.wordpress.com. Wonderful. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with everybody? Um, no, I, I just want to thank you so much. I'm such a huge fan of yours. And I'm just so honored that, you know, you wanted to have me on your podcast. Thank you. And that's where we'll end this week's episode. Thank you so much for joining me. Until next time. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Wait a second. You didn't think I'd actually forget to thank my patrons, did you? It's because of these wonderful people that this show is commercial free and without their generosity, it would not exist. If you'd like to become a patron of my podcast, you can go to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and click become a patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support. With that, I would like to thank Gabby, Adrian, Stacy C, Angela G, Mary J, Heidi, Christopher, Jennifer, Shelby, Sari, Sue, Johanna, Doris, Courtney, Bob, Diana, Rachel, Michelle, Lacey, Diane, Kathy, Katie, Joy, James, Anne, Azaria, Lisa, Nora, Sarah, Wendy, Mary T, Cynthia, Melissa, Nikki, Cheryl, Carrie, Tanya, Donna, Catherine, Jen, Lara, Megan, Pat, and Heather from the English Renaissance History Podcast. Thank you again for joining me. Until next time.